Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the curator of public programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. The Fowler Museum is thrilled to be welcoming visitors back to our galleries, but for now we are continuing to offer our programs virtually. So thank you for joining us today or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from around the world. Today's program is presented as part of the Fowler Share the Mic series. The Fowler believes in the civic duty of museums to give form to multiple points of view. Our Share the Mic series features thought leaders, artists, activists, and allies who are guiding us along the arc of justice. Currently on view, the map in the territory, 100 years of collecting at UCLA, distills the vast holdings of UCLA's diverse collections into a single exhibition. The borders and boundaries section of the map in the territory explores how borders affect relationships among individuals, communities, and places. Some boundaries are systemic and require decades of struggle to overcome. Today, we are welcoming UCLA professor Eric Avila for a program centered around his book, The Folklore of the Freeway, Race and Revolt in the Modern City. His book maps the creative strategies devised by urban communities in the 60s and 70s to document and protest the damage wrought by highways, which cut through and destroyed many communities of color. Today, we will learn about this history, the impact of redlining on LA's Boyle Heights, the work of the Latinx artists who critiqued and satirized highway construction as a racist and sexist enterprise, and the influence of these diverse communities on contemporary urban policy. Eric Avila, professor of history and Chicano Chicana studies at UCLA, also holds a courtesy appointment in the Department of Urban Planning. He's a 20th century US urban historian whose research and teaching emphasize race and equity, ethnicity, cultural expression, and the built environment. Avila earned his BA, MA, and PhD degrees in history from UC Berkeley and is the author of two books in addition to the one we'll be learning about today, Popular Culture in the Age of White Flight, Fear and Fantasy in Suburban, suburban Los Angeles from 2004, and American Cultural History, a very short introduction from 2018. Before we get going, two quick technical bits of housekeeping. Once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options at the top of your screen and select side by side mode so the video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. And if you have any questions during this program, please do submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions that you would like to be considered to be answered at the end of the program. All right, that's enough from me. Over to you, Eric. Thank you so much, Bianca, for that very nice introduction. Um, thank you also to Erica Lee and the staff of the Fowler Museum and to the Fowler Museum for the invitation to speak today. Um, it's a great honor and, and thank you everyone who's joining us. I really appreciate um, your interest in the discussion and, and the invitation to be here. So, so thank you everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. and go into slide mode. And you should be looking at the cover of my 2014 book, The Folklore of the Freeway, Race and Revolt in the Modernist City. So the talk that I'm giving today is based on research from this book, which is a history of highway construction in the urban United States after 1956. 1956 was the year uh, that Congress made a massive investment in infrastructure, um, the construction of the national interstate highway system. And my book explores the impact of highway construction in urban America after 1956, and particularly its impact on minority communities, and even more particularly, how people in those communities conveyed their opposition to that work to that highway building project. Um, in the book, I look at art, literature, muralism, and other forms of cultural expression as examples of community protest against highway construction. Communities that had no recourse other than cultural expression. Communities that lacked political power and economic wealth. 
Um, in the talk today, I will focus on the Los Angeles neighborhood of Boyle Heights, a neighborhood directly east of downtown Los Angeles, a neighborhood that I consider to be the capital of the city's east side, uh, historically a, a working class, ethnically and racially diverse neighborhood that became an undiverse Mexican-American barrio, the na nation's largest Mexican-American working class neighborhood after about 1970. The neighborhood of Boyle Heights, as I will get into, was ravaged by highway construction in the 1950s and 1960s. And today, uh, it marks the point of intersection of all the major freeways that define the greater Los Angeles freeway system. So more on that in a moment. But first, let me introduce you to the highwaymen. The California Highway Commission from 1950. Um, these men were the leaders of uh, California's division of highways. And they were the ones who carried out the plans and projects um, implemented by the federal interstate highway program that was passed by Congress in 1956. Uh, this undiverse group of men built California's highway system and contributed to a vital link in a national highway infrastructure. This was an empowered generation of highwaymen. They enjoyed lavish state funding for their project, and they worked in an age that celebrated the automobile and particularly its suburban lifestyle. And this undiverse group of men also positioned themselves in the language of science to carry out and justify their work. They used data collected through traffic surveys, desire line maps, and other ostensibly empirical forms of research and data collection to determine highway routing in urban areas in California. Armed with this data, they claimed a stance of neutrality and objectivity, and they enjoyed what highway historians call a scientific mystique that denied questions of bias, equity, and accountability, at least for a while. But what I'd like to show you in this talk today is that there was bias in their work, a great deal of bias in their work, despite their claims to objectivity. So take a look at the master plan for California's freeway and expressway system for District 7 in 1965. This map is from 1965. District 7 was the district designated by the California Division of Highways uh, that pertained to the greater Los Angeles area, um, defined here as Ventura County, Los Angeles County, and Orange County. Um, this is what the master plan from the Division of Highways looked like in 1965. These were all the freeways that were green lighted by the Division of Highways with federal funding from the Interstate Highway Act. What we're looking at here is a proposal for an urban grid of freeways superimposed upon the urbanized area of Los Angeles. And the intention was to leave no residential community more than four miles away from a freeway on-ramp or off-ramp. So this was the ideal, this was the master plan, this was the intention. In this slide, we can compare the master plan with the actual reality um, of freeways that were, were built. Um, you can see clearly that this map looks almost nothing like this map. Um, and there are even some shortages here, like the 710 freeway um, that was supposed to connect north into Pasadena. You can see by comparing these two maps, the 
planned versus the actual, that not even half of the proposed highway system as designated by California's Division of Highways came to fruition. Why? Why was that the case? Well, there were procedural delays, funding shortages, and community opposition. The most famous example of community opposition, the most famous example of what we call the freeway revolt in Southern California, was the Beverly Hills fight against the two freeway. Um, the two freeway was defeated successfully by local residents from Beverly Hills, a very wealthy, very well-connected, politically well-connected community. The two freeway was supposed to run along Santa Monica Boulevard um, from its current terminus in Echo Park all the way west along Santa Monica Boulevard, all the way to the Santa Monica Bay. Uh, that was supposed to be the two freeway. And it was one of many freeways that was canceled uh, in wealthier, whiter neighborhoods of the Los Angeles region. Um, the Malibu freeway was also defeated by residents in Malibu. Um, and same with the Topanga freeway. Those are examples of freeways that were not built um, due to community opposition on the west side. Now, this kind of opposition was not unique to Los Angeles. The freeway revolt that I'm describing here was in fact a national uprising against urban highway construction, mostly in white middle-class and upper middle-class communities. The most famous examples of the freeway revolt uh, nationally in American cities uh, were the revolts in Boston, New York City and Lower Manhattan, as well as San, San Francisco. Now, there were freeway protests in other parts of Los Angeles at the time. Um, take, for example, Boyle Heights. Now, historically, Boyle Heights has been a racially and ethnically working class community, a diverse community. Um, one of the few historically multiracial, multi-ethnic working class neighborhoods in Los Angeles, going back to the early 20th century. Um, in the 1950s, the multiracial, multi-ethnic uh, neighbors, residents of Boyle Heights, uh, staged a number of protests against highway construction, against the proposal for the intersection of six freeways in the Boyle Heights area. These protests from Boyle Heights in the 1950s reflected interracial political alliances that became the hallmark of Los Angeles politics much later in the 20th century. Um, but you can see just by looking at this map that the citizens of Boyle Heights lost their fight against the construction of six freeways and their interchanges, whereas Beverly Hills successfully defeated the construction of one freeway in their community. Um, in looking at this map, take a look also at these huge interchanges that link the major freeway arteries that define LA's freeway system. Um, and just look at the amount of land consumed by the construction of these massive freeway interchanges. Um, it's estimated, and these interchanges over here as well, it's estimated that about one quarter of the existing housing supply in Boyle Heights in the late 1960s uh, was taken out by uh, highway construction in, in the 1950s and 1960s. And you know, today we're, we're very aware of a, a critical housing shortage in Los Angeles. And one of the factors that, that we can attribute um, to the present day housing shortage um, was the removal of the housing stock going back to highway construction of the 1950s and 1960s. Here's another map of Boyle Heights, just to kind of give you a sense of, of where Boyle Heights is located. Um, note its, its direct proximity just to the east of downtown Los Angeles, right here. 
And this map gives you a sense of the location of Boyle Heights within the overall city of Los Angeles. And this map is a more vernacular map of Boyle Heights. Um, and again, note the prominence of the freeway architecture outlined in heavy black lines. Here's an aerial shot of, of Boyle Heights. Um, Boyle Heights is, is here to the east. Uh, downtown is here to the west or the left side of, of the screen. Um, historically, Boyle Heights has been separated from downtown Los Angeles and all points west through multiple corridors of transit infrastructure. Um, we could begin here, for example, with the Los Angeles River, uh, which was turned into a concrete ditch by the US Army Corps of Engineer in the 1930s. You can also note the presence of rail lines dating back to the late 19th century which also divided Boyle Heights from downtown Los Angeles. Um, and then finally, in the 1950s and 1960s, um, two federally funded freeway projects, the 101 freeway here, which begins here in Boyle Heights, and the five freeway or the Golden State Freeway are two other lines of transit that reinforce the historic isolation of Boyle Heights from the rest of Los Angeles and from downtown Los Angeles in particular. Um, so note the kind of overlapping layers uh, of transit lines that, that segregated, isolated, or essentially quarantined Boyle Heights from downtown Los Angeles. Now, here's a little more history on Boyle Heights. Boyle Heights is what's considered to be a redlined neighborhood. Redlining is a term that we use to describe the consequence of federal policies dating back to the 1930s. Uh, the policies that created the Homeowners Loan Corporation in 1933, otherwise known as the HOLC, um, and also the creation of the FHA or the Federal Housing Administration in 1934. Um, the primary contribution of the HOLC or the Homeowners Loan Corporation um, was the innovation of what we call the self-amortizing loan. Um, those of us who are homeowners are familiar with the self-amortizing loan, uh, the loan that uh, dies essentially over a, a 30 year period of monthly payments. Um, that was a, a federal policy innovation credited to the Homeowners Loan Corporation in 1933. Um, and then the Federal Housing Administration's job was to oversee um, the expansion of the housing market, especially the revival of the housing market uh, during the depths of the Great Depression in the mid 1930s. And in its own words, the purpose of the Federal Housing Administration was to encourage improvement in housing standards and conditions, to facilitate sound home financing, and to exert a stabilizing influence on the mortgage market. The combined effect of the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration um, was to essentially revolutionize the national housing market um, and essentially ultimately to democratize home ownership for mostly white middle class and white working class Americans. Um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, the Federal Housing Administration, the housing policies of the New Deal administration during the 1930s under the leadership of, of President Roosevelt, um, essentially laid a structural foundation for the post-World War II suburban boom that ensued during the late 1940s and throughout the 1950s and 1960s. Now, in addition, the Homeowners Loan Corporation developed a standardized 
nationalized set of criteria for assessing urban properties and their economic worth or value to both homeowners and mortgage lenders. Uh, according to this criteria system innovated by the HOLC, uh, it depended upon the creation of four categories, each category designated by letter, number, and color. Um, the green areas were the areas were considered to be safest for investment. Uh, a areas or green areas were called first grade areas. They were neighborhoods that were considered to be new, homogenous, and I'll come back to that term in a moment. And according to the HOLC, in the words of the HOLC, neighborhoods that were quote, in demand in residential locations in good times and bad. Uh, neighborhoods that were occupied by quote, American business and professional men. The second category, according to the HOLC, were B neighborhoods. They were called second grade neighborhoods. They were assigned the color blue and they were defined as still desirable areas that had reached their peak, but were expected to remain stable. C areas were called third grade neighborhoods. They were assigned the color yellow, and they were neighborhoods that were considered to be definitely declining. Finally, there were D neighborhoods or fourth grade neighborhoods assigned the color red, areas in which the things taking place in C areas have already happened. Um, and that's why they were called redlined areas because of their uh, assignment of the color red on a map of an American city. The red areas were considered to be the riskiest investment and usually were prohibited from any kind of public or private investment. So this survey, these, these categories of criteria uh, were used to assess urban property values, urban neighborhoods, um, and according to the HOLC, which was a federal agency, um, this comprised a formal, uniform, and nationalized criteria uh, of appraisal. The idea was that a, a, a homeowner or a mortgage lender or a private bank could, could uh, access the data, the assessment of the HOLC in order to make uh, decisions informed decisions about whether or not to either buy a property or invest in a property or lend uh, to purchase property in a particular neighborhood of any American city with a population greater than 10,000 people. So with this data, after the HOLC had sent in basically an army of its officers into every American city with a population greater than, than 10,000 people. Uh, after the appraisers had visited those neighborhoods and made their assessments, that data was then compiled into these color-coded maps. And this is the HOLC map for Los Angeles uh, created in, in 1939. And every American city had a map like this based upon the data collected by HOLC officials. Um, in looking at this map, you can see Beverly Hills is clearly a green neighborhood, um, safe for investment. Uh, Los Feliz around here, also a green neighborhood. Basically, you know, the hillsides of the Santa Monica Mountains were green neighborhoods. Um, closer to downtown Los Angeles, you have a lot of red neighborhoods. And moving south uh, towards Watts and Compton, these are also redlined neighborhoods. Um, here are the communities of Huntington Park and Southgate, Maywood. Uh, in the 1930s and 1940s, these were solidly white, uh, working class and, and middle class neighborhoods. And because they were racially homogenous of white residents, 
Um, they were not redlined neighborhoods, but I'll explain how all of this worked um, in a moment. So this is what the actual survey forms uh, looked like. The survey forms that HOLC officials uh, took into every neighborhood of every American city um, and used these forms to evaluate uh, an urban parcel of land or an urban neighborhood according to the criteria established by the HOLC. So I'm just going to um, escape out of my PowerPoint for one moment so that I can just kind of zoom in on this form. It was a one page form like this. And you can zoom in to take a little bit of a closer look. And, and you can see the different categories before we even look at what is filled into this form. Just look at the categories and the number one category in order for the HOLT, HOLC to assess the value of urban property in any given urban neighborhood, the number one single most important criteria um, is the criteria of population. Who lives there? That is the most important factor that determines the worth of urban property according to the HOLC. Now, in looking for Boyle Heights, Again, just looking at the categories of, of the form, not looking at what was filled in. This tells you what the HLC was looking for um, in, its, in its assessment of urban property. Who was living there? What was the class and occupation of the people living there? How many foreign families were living there? Uh, is the population increasing or decreasing? Um, were there any Negroes? Uh, this is the language of the survey form. Um, so you can see from this form that African-Americans were the only group that was singled out as, as an official category or subcategory um, on the HOLC forms. And then here's a, a, a curious term, at least curious to our eyes, is this term shifting or infiltration. Who is infiltrating the population of this neighborhood? Is the population shifting? And in looking even closer to see what the HOLC official filled out um, for, we're talking about Boyle Heights here at the very bottom, the, na the name of the neighborhood is identified. For Boyle Heights, um, we can see that it was a very racially and ethnically diverse neighborhood. Jewish professional and businessmen, Mexican laborers, 50% um, foreign families, nationalities, Russian, Polish, and Armenian Jews, Slavs, Greeks, American, Mexicans, Japanese, and Italians, um, and a 1% assessment of a black population. And under the subcategory of shifting or infiltration, it reads subversive racial elements increasing. Now, this is the language of the federal government in the 1930s. And what's curious when, when we look at, you know, what the HOLC official um, uh, filled in, um, we can read a very diverse array of ethnic and racial groups. Um, some of those groups are still considered not white today. And some of the groups are considered white today. And that's just to underscore, um, the changing balance of racial identity. Racial identity is a very fluid construct. Despite what the US census says, um, who is of a certain race and who isn't is always changing according to an always changing set of historical circumstances. Anyway, the main point that I wanna make here is that this category of population was the single most important factor that the HOLC used to determine the economic worth or value of property in any given neighborhood in any American city. After population, then we go into more obvious criteria like the condition of the buildings. How much new construction is there? 
um, overhang of home properties, sale of home properties. And then at the very bottom, well, at the very, very bottom, there is the factual information, the location of the neighborhood, the assessment of the neighborhood. This is a fourth grade area. Remember the letter D, the color red. Um, on a map, you could find it as D53. And this is from April 14th, 1939. Now, in looking at this bottom section, um, this was a blank space where the HOLC official um, was basically an open space for the HOLC official to fill in his written evaluation of the neighborhood. And in the case of this particular form for Boyle Heights, this is what was written. The HOLC official wrote that Boyle Heights is a melting pot area and is literally honeycombed with diverse and subversive racial elements. It is seriously doubted whether there is a single block in the area which does not contain detrimental racial elements, and there are very few districts which are not hopelessly heterogeneous. I'm just underlining the language here, uh, detrimental and literally honeycombed. I mean, this is the way that federal representatives, federal officials talked about uh, groups of people who were not considered to be white in 1939. Um, that definitely included uh, African Americans, Mexican Americans, Japanese and Chinese Americans, um, but also other ethnic groups uh, uh, that were also not considered white according to the HOLC. Now, the most important part of this that I wanna to bring to your attention is these last two sentences. Boyle Heights is a hazardous residential territory I want to get my laser pointer back. Hazardous residential territory and is accorded a general medial red grade, although in many parts slum conditions prevail. Now, this last sentence I think is critical for the purposes of my talk. The federal government in conjunction with the city government are undertaking a slum clearance project covering 41 areas in the Northeast part of the area. Now, think about that. Undertaking a slum clearance project covering 41 acres. Well, in looking at the map of Boyle Heights, a redlined neighborhood, according to the HOLC, in looking at this map, what do you think that slum clearance project was? It's very obvious in looking at this to see how highway construction uh, worked as a form of slum clearance in redlined neighborhoods like Boyle Heights. American urban policy in the mid 20th century coordinated the major structural processes that were reshaping the American city. This meant that slum clearance, urban renewal, and highway construction were coordinated policies. They worked in tandem with each other. They reinforced each other. Um, and they were all designed to modernize the city, to get rid of slums, and to accommodate a new suburban way of life that depended upon the automobile and autonomous mobility. Because it was a redlined neighborhood, because it was defined as a slum, uh, hopelessly heterogeneous, literally honeycombed with diverse and subversive racial elements. Boyle Heights was very much in the way uh, of the federal vision of suburbs and highways, and its subversive racial elements were all the more reason to tear down the neighborhood in the name of progress. This was bias at work. This was racial bias at work. Despite the objective stance of the post-war generation of highway builders. 
despite their invocation of data and science, their work followed and reinforced the hierarchies of race, class, and power in Los Angeles and other American cities. Now, this legacy is highly contested. Even though there were protests in Boyle Heights against the construction of massive freeway infrastructure, and even though those protests were in vain, there is what I call a hidden record of resistance and opposition in the cultural landscape of Boyle Heights and similar communities. Um, for example, this is a mural by the Los Angeles artist Judith Baca. And this mural recounts the history of Boyle Heights during the 1950s and 1960s. Murals were an important aspect of Mexican American or Chicano cultural activism. And they were an expression of a, a community to pass on knowledge and history to other members of the community. By the 1970s, Boyle Heights was quickly becoming a barrio, a concentration of Mexican-American poverty, Mexican-American and Mexican immigrant poverty in this case. Boyle Heights lost its historic racial and ethnic diversity after the disruption of highway construction. Uh, highway construction essentially uh, dispersed the multiracial, multi-ethnic uh, character population of Boyle Heights. It facilitated white flight out of the neighborhood. Um, but after 1970, Boyle Heights became the epicenter of the Chicano movement. And it unleashed a rich outpouring of political activism and cultural expression, all in the service of ethnic pride and community empowerment. A new generation of Chicano and Chicana artists allied their work with the goals of the Mexican American civil rights movement. They painted scenes of their community, of life in the barrio and the dominant features of the barrio landscape. They portrayed the freeway and how it isolated their community from the rest of the city. This is a view of downtown Los Angeles looking west from Boyle Heights. And note how the freeway frames the view of downtown Los Angeles from Boyle Heights. This is a painting by the Chicano activist, uh, artist and Boyle Heights native Frank Romero. And this is what Boyle Heights looks like to Frank Romero looking at downtown LA from Boyle Heights. And you can clearly see how the freeway frames the view of the city from a Boyle Heights native. Other Chicano artists depicted the shadows that freeways cast upon their community. They imagined the destruction of the freeway and its menace to their community. Their art often included a subtle or wry criticism of freeways and their intrusion upon the neighborhood. In this painting by David Boteo, look at how the photographer is using a willow tree to block the sight of an ugly freeway in the background. Look at how the truck belches smoke directly onto the wedding party and the residents of Boyle Heights. This is what East Los Angeles looks like. And no matter where you look, the freeway is always there. By the way, this is a scene from Hollenbeck Park, one of the few green spaces in a park poor part of Los Angeles. Once upon a time, Hollenbeck Park was a, a tourist attraction, a civic asset that enhanced the natural beauty of Boyle Heights. In the 1950s, however, following the dictates of redlining and cost efficiency, the division of highways decided that Hollenbeck Park was well suited for the construction of the 101 freeway where it converges with Interstate 5. In Boyle Heights, there is a clear local awareness of freeways and the challenge they pose to everyday life in a working class immigrant and deeply racialized neighborhood. In, liter in literature, poetry, murals, art, and other forms of cultural expression, Mexican-Americans express their opposition to the freeway 
and its looming presence in everyday life. This is a mural that sits across from an on-ramp of the Interstate 5 freeway in Boyle Heights, depicting a local resident taking a sledgehammer to the concrete wall in his face. And then a flower springs forth from the cracks opened up by the sledgehammer. Um, directly across from this mural on Cummings Street, by the way, Cummings Street, precisely around this point, is where the famous uh, Los Angeles photographer Julius Shulman grew up uh, with his family in the neighborhood of Boyle Heights. But his family's home uh, was erased by the construction of this very freeway, Interstate 5. Um, and Shulman and his family um, displaced to other parts of the city. Shulman, in fact, went to the Laurel Canyon neighborhood um, of the West Side, where he became a famous photographer of the suburban good life in Los Angeles. Um, and Sherman, uh, Shulman um, left Boyle Heights um, and, and, and turned his camera upon the more affluent parts of the city developing on the West Side and other parts of Los Angeles. But this mural is directly, apart, uh, directly across from the on-ramp to the Interstate 5 freeway in Boyle Heights. And if you look at the, the wording right here of the mural, it reads, even concrete walls cannot stop the beauty of life. And I think that's a good place to end this talk um, because I think it documents a community's awareness of what happened to its neighborhood in the age of highway construction. And it also demonstrates a community's opposition to that project, but also a community's resilience, a community's determination um, to carry on the project of creating beauty, uh, even in the midst of ugly freeway landscapes like this. So I'm gonna stop here, but I, I look forward and, and welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. That was incredibly interesting information that you shared with us. And it's so important that these histories don't get lost. So thank you very much for making sure that they stay accessible and archived for the rest of us to reference. We have some really good questions here in the Q&A portal. And I encourage you to keep submitting them as we work our way through these. Um, I'd like to start with a question from Sufia Sadaf. Um, who wonders if the red zones were also increasingly low priced areas where the, the immigrants who had lesser means would head to um, and that the other zones were just out of reach because of their high pricing and racial discrimination? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, most red line neighborhoods were working class neighborhoods, um, but they were active neighborhoods. They were self-sustaining neighborhoods. Um, they were not just neighborhoods, they were communities, and they were communities that were supported by schools and churches um, and markets and other institutions that, that strengthen a working class community's fabric. Um, what happened uh, was that redlining um, enforced a kind of downward spiral of these neighborhoods. Redlining reinforced um, the decline of economic value of these neighborhoods because what redlining did, what is it, it essentially uh, discouraged any form of public and private investment in these areas. So the neighborhoods today that we call ghettos in barrios do not have to be ghettos in barrios. They became ghettos and barrios largely because of the consequences of redlining, not because of the working class character of the people who lived there. Thank you. We have another question um, from Rashid, who says, um, with redlining maps of Los Angeles, um, how did race, class, and immigration converge related to the question we just um, addressed? For example, the Boyle Heights uh, highlights a specific class of Jewish residents, quote, professional and businessmen, and notes that the foreign presence of Russian, Polish, and Armenian Jews. Um, and they're curious to know if there were other LA-specific racial um, notations in those documents? Well, I, that's a point that I, I, I tried to make rather clumsily in, in, in my talk. But, you know, here's the thing. In 1939, um, 
even the most successful Jewish businessmen were still considered to be racial groups because they were Jewish. Um, so, so their Jewish ethnic and religious character um, made them part of a racial group uh, in, in the eyes of the homeowners loan corporation. Um, in fact, many neighborhoods in Los Angeles in the early 20th century um, were off limits to, to Jewish residents. Um, but that largely changed after World War II. Um, and many neighborhoods in suburban areas of the West Side, of the San Fernando Valley, um, Lakewood is a very famous example, Orange County, um, opened up to Jewish settlement um, in a way that it did not open up to African Americans, Mexican Americans, or even Asian Americans. Um, so all this goes to underscore the malleability, the flexibility, the changeability of racial identity according to a changing set of historical circumstances. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Christian. Um, in your opinion, what if any impact of the freeway construction displacement and redlining exists today in connection with the gentrification occurring in Boyle Heights? That's a very good question. Um, I don't think that, that anyone has made any like direct links between highway construction and um, uh, gentrification. Um, but because of highway construction and because of redlining, Boyle Heights for decades was a underinvested neighborhood. It was a poor neighborhood and it was a neighborhood that was isolated from wealth um, and, and investment, public or private investment. However, today, you know, think about, think about the, the path of gentrification in Los Angeles, right? You know, it, it began in Venice as far back as the 1950s and 60s. Then it moved uh, east to West Hollywood in the 1960s and 70s. It moved to parts of Hollywood. Um, and then in the 1970s and 80s, it moved to, to Silver Lake. Um, around 2000, it moved to Echo Park, and now downtown, my neighborhood, is also rapidly gentrifying. So what's, what's next in that kind of falling pattern of dominoes of gentrification? What's next is Boyle Heights. Um, and in spite of 50 years of redlining and disinvestment of, of, of Boyle Heights, that is now the new frontier for gentrification, particularly as the population of, of LA and Southern California um, has exploded exponentially over the past several decades. Um, plus, you throw in the construction of Metro as an alternative to the automobile and the freeway. Um, and that's a mixed blessing for Boyle Heights because on the one hand, the Metro promises to reintegrate Boyle Heights into the larger urban fabric in a way that, that highways did the opposite. But at the same time, it's making Boyle Heights a more desirable neighborhood, um, which, which primes it for gentrification and investment. Um, and that has racial and ethnic consequences, as we know. Very good question. Yeah, and someone actually was about, uh, I was gonna ask you a question from RJ about the subways, and he's wondering if the gold, red, and purple um, will alleviate these above ground issues or if they'll exacerbate them, which you just kind of answered, right? It's a mixed bag. Absolutely, it's a mixed bag. And, you know, I, I think that um, the city and the state and the federal government have to um, find ways to make sure um, that the consequences of gentrification do not reinforce existing patterns of inequality in LA. Yeah, and so looking to the future, Liza asks what you think the next crisis will be. Um, you know, it might be gentrification. Liza's wondering if the overvaluation of real estate might push, um, you know, the Boyle Heights community out. And um, they're wondering what you think the next crisis will be. That's a good question. I, I, I don't have a crystal ball. And, and, you know, as a historian, I'm really stuck in the past. That's, you know, where my research is. Um, but, you know, the only thing I would say to that is that, you know, right now, there are a number of protests, community-based protests against gentrification. 
in Boyle Heights. So for, for many residents of Boyle Heights um, who have lived there for, for decades, whose families have been there for decades, um, gentrification is that crisis. It is a looming crisis that threatens to um, push uh, property values and, and rents way up and threatens to push people out of the neighborhood, um, people who have found Boyle Heights to be one of the few affordable places to live in the city. That's, that's the looming crisis from their perspective. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have maybe time for like two, maybe three more questions. Um, Mike Goodman wonders if you can discuss the influence of restrictive permanence on the ethnic composition of the various neighborhoods. Yeah, so, so restrictive covenants um, really work to shape um, uh, white racial uh, exclusivity in many, many LA neighborhoods going back to the earliest decades of the 20th century. So a neighborhood that comes to mind would be um, Palos Verdes, for example, was a neighborhood that uh, used racial restrictive covenants. Um, Basically, those are agreements by homeowners, by white homeowners, who make a pact, either a formal or an informal pact, um, to agree not to sell their property to members of any racial group other than the white race. And many, many neighborhoods, Los Feliz, Bel Air, um, Palisades, Brentwood, uh, many neighborhoods used uh, racially restrictive covenants, homeowners association, and zoning policies um, to keep out non-white uh, people from their neighborhoods. Um, and that already shaped a racially exclusive geography in, in the LA region uh, well before the innovation of redlining. Great question. Okay, two more questions left. Um, do you know about the latest efforts to resist the 605 widening project, which could displace hundreds of Latino families? Um, no, I'm, I'm not very well, well versed in that effort. I mean, I, 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 I've read recently that the 710 project has been officially wiped off the map. Um, that, that was the, the, the freeway that was supposed to connect the 710 freeway all the way um, to the Arroyo Parkway in, in Pasadena. Um, that that uh, project uh, is officially gone. Um, and it was a 40 year battle um, of community opposition from South Pasadena and Pasadena to fight that freeway. Um, but the 605 is another example of, of a freeway that has a long history of, of community opposition. All right, thank you, Eric. So let's wrap up with this last question. People want to know what you're working on now. What's coming next for you? Oh, thank you. Thank you for asking that. Um, right now, I'm working on a history of Los Angeles between 1965 and 1992. Um, and for those of you who know LA history, you'll know that that is a history of LA between the Watts riots and the Rodney King uprising. Um, so it's a history of LA in the 1970s and 80s. And I want to talk about um, the radical transformation of the city and its identity in that time, largely because of, of globalization and the um, influx of, of diverse immigrants um, from all over the world who completely transformed the meaning and the identity of LA um, in between these, these moments of, of racial violence and racial inequality. That sounds very, very interesting. Um, be sure to let me know when that one's coming out and maybe we can bring you back, Eric. Thank you, I will. All right, thank you again, Eric, for um, giving us so much of your energy over this last hour. That was really, really impressive. We have so many questions that went unanswered, so I'll be sure to send you the Q&A report so you can take a look at anything that um, you might wish to reach out and answer. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we have recorded this program and it will be available immediately on our Facebook. So if you need it in a timely manner, you can go to our Facebook and check it out there. Otherwise it'll be posted on our website and on our Instagram in the coming days. And we invite you to revisit it and share. And we hope that you'll join us again for our next program. You can find details on the closing slide. In the meantime, please have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.